Let's talk about bayonets used as fighting knives. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So a while ago I did a bunch of videos in quick succession talking about bayonets, but I was specifically in that case talking about bayonets fit, fitted on actual firearms, so muskets and rifles. Um, and I, as many of my viewers will know, I've got an SMLE um, rifle, 303, um, British World War One dated rifle. Um, I've also got uh, muzzle loading um, muskets and rifles as well. And um, I've talked quite a lot about um, bayonets and their advantages and, and their context in which they were used and why they were a very important weapon in the 19th century and right the way through to definitely to World War One and in some aspects even in World War Two as well um, and I've also explained uh, the kind of relative strengths and weaknesses of bayonets compared to swords and other things like this but an interesting question that came up actually from several people um, under different videos was are bayonets any good as fighting knives well what I'm holding here is the SMLE bayonet that goes with my SMLE um, rifle. Um, and is this one dated? I can't remember. Let's have a look. So the first thing to mention about the SMLE bayonet, if I just pull out a tape measure, it uh, is fairly long. So it's a 17 inch blade. Um, this is the 1907 pattern. And um, having a 17 inch blade means that despite the fact that the SMLE is a relatively, by 19th century or late 19th century um, sort of uh, relative terms, is a relatively short rifle. It's the SMLE, is the short magazine Lee Enfield. There is also a long magazine Lee Enfield, um, which was the one that was used during the Boer War. Um, and when the short uh, magazine rifle came in in Britain, it was regarded as not really quite long enough for bayonet fighting with, so they gave it a long bayonet. We can actually see uh, similar comparisons with uh, French and German and other nationality rifles of the beginning of the 20th century because it was still considered that bayonets and bayonet fighting was still an important thing to prepare for and that you expect might happen. Um, not necessarily in um, open sort of warfare, in for example, in the Franco-Prussian War, where most of the fighting was done in large open spaces and uh, was really um, governed by long-range rifle fire and artillery. But in World War I, despite the fact artillery caused the most casualties in World War I, a lot of fighting was done at very close range because, of course, trench warfare. And not only trench warfare. So a lot of people put down the amount of hand-to-hand -hand combat in um, World War I just down to trench warfare and the uh, requirements of having to come close to opponents in trenches, storming trenches, the fact that trenches were often in zigzag lines so you couldn't necessarily shoot very far, you couldn't necessarily therefore shoot at someone before they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat range. And and indeed night raiding as well and obviously in night raiding you're more likely to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat necessarily than shooting especially with something like a bolt action rifle which doesn't have a high rate of fire not relative to modern automatic weapons anyway um, and of course we see things like pump action shotguns and submachine guns come about in world war one for this reason to try and improve the effectiveness of, of firearms in those scenarios where a bolt action rifle doesn't really cut the mustard but um, a lot of people put down the use of um, the use of bayonets and other hand hand weapons, cavalry swords and lances, for example, which were also still used in World War One, uh, to trench warfare. But there are other reasons for it as well. We actually see um, when trench, when the trench warfare stage was kind of passing out in kind of 1918 at the end of the war, we actually start to see large um, sort of use of cavalry again and cavalry to pursue fleeing enemies, uh, to attack uh, baggage um, trains and artillery and placements and things like this, machine gun nests and that kind of stuff. Um, but additionally, people often forget about the fact that it was a world war. It wasn't only a war that was happening in Belgium. Um, it was a war that was also happening, for example, in the Middle East and North Africa. And it actually, if we look at the uh, combat, for example, uh, Gallipoli, um, and if we look at the combat with the Turks uh, between the, um, the Arab army, the Arab revolt army under Lawrence of Arabia, but if we look at other conflicts within that war, we also see hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords and, like I say, with swords and lances and knives and bayonets. Now, coming back to the actual question, um, 
And predominantly when we talk about bayonets, we're considering it being fixed on the end of a rifle. But there are situations where for various reasons you might decide to use your bayonet not on the end of the rifle. What might that situation be? Well, quite simply, it could be um, on a night raid into a trench. So one of the things um, with, if we look at British, French, um, German uh, bayonets on rifles, you've still got a fairly long object, which if you're fighting someone in hand-to-hand -hand combat in an open space or even in a large room, a large building, then essentially it's a short spear and that's a short heavy spear and that's a useful thing against someone who's got something like a knife or a sword because you can outreach them. However, if you're jumping into trenches, as everybody I should imagine watching this channel knows, we see the use of things like trench knives, knuckle dusters, um, small axes, hatchets, um, clubs, maces, even flails um, in World War I trench raiding. And the reason for that is the nature of the fighting often, it was incredibly close range, essentially punching and kicking and wrestling range. And in those situations, a long bayonet on a rifle is actually, you might get one good stab at someone, but then someone else might attack you from here and you can't bring your weapon around to bear on them and fight against them. So in these kind of situations, we know for a fact that sometimes both um, private soldiers and um, officers sometimes elected to use weapons that were specifically shorter. Now some of you might uh, immediately think, Matt, were swords ever used? Well yes they were. Um, officer swords and other types of swords, certain types of um, cutlass for example and, and, and indeed large bayonets and things like machetes and stuff were indeed used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, it seems that most soldiers preferred um, either, the most common, I would say, as far as I can tell, in trench fighting, the most common close combat weapons were, number one, percussion weapons, percussive weapons such as clubs uh, and shovels and things like this. And on the other hand, um, things like small fighting knives. Um, now I'll probably do another, in fact I'll certainly do another video talking about um, World War I fighting knives at some point because there's lots of interesting things to say about those. But again, coming back to the question, could you use a bayonet as a fighting knife? Yes, the absolute, the absolute answer categorically is yes you could. Would it make a good fighting knife? Well, not bad, yeah. The funny thing is, is that um, Many people will kind of, on my channel, I'm famous for going kind of longer is better, okay? And um, generally speaking, in most hand-to-hand -hand combat situations, a longer weapon it does give you an advantage over someone with a shorter weapon. But as I've just explained, in nighttime trench raiding, that's not always the situation. If you're really at punch and kicking distance, sometimes an overly long bayonet might be easier for an opponent to block or grab or grapple with or disarm you. Uh, it might be more difficult to get the point to bear. Um, and so we do actually see bayonets like this. In fact, this exact model and other bayonets of the period for example, a French Liebel or Lebel um, bayonet and the various types of uh, Mauser German bayonet as well, we do sometimes see them converted into fighting knives. And one of the first things and one of the most common things we see when they're used, when they're converted, when they're specifically made into a fighting knife is the blade would get shortened. Now, an easy way to do that is simply get a hacksaw and saw the blade off here and then reshape the point. So you just simply pretty much half the length of the blade. So you go from a 17 inch blade down to let's say about a nine inch blade. And it's interesting because in my own experimentations with, if I just grab a Bowie knife, for example, I've found that in sparring with simulator Bowie knives, um, that um, yes, whilst a large one can be used kind of like a small sword, there is a kind of, I think there's kind of an optimum size for fighting knives um, that for me personally tends to be about nine or ten inches and that's about as big as they can comfortably be worn and carried and deployed unsheathed quickly and indeed used in close combat. I find knives that are bigger than that, they might be great in a one-on-one -on -one dueling situation but they can be a bit unwieldy in a kind of pell-mell fighting you know close in uh, combat situation and indeed of course they're bigger to carry and they take longer to get out of the sheath. Um, 
So for numerous reasons, it's very clear that both World War I and World War II soldiers, in their mind, whatever you feel about my opinions on this subject, it's categorically the case that fighting knives were usually between about five or six inches up to about nine inches and very rarely longer than that. And so therefore most bayonets, whether it's the French, British or German bayonets, most bayonets that were common issue during World War I were too long, at least too long by the perception of the soldiers who wanted a fighting knife. So for example, uh, what we commonly see, as I mentioned, is the shortening of a blade and then the reshaping of the tip. Very often the tip, because the thrust is the predominant way that these were used, they were being used essentially like a later uh, Fairbairn Sykes dagger. Um, and so making the tip more slender, more pointy, and definitely very sharp is a good thing. You don't necessarily need as much robustness uh, as you do with a bayonet. So a bayonet has to be kind of overbuilt to a certain extent because it comes under huge amounts of leverage and um, kind of abusive testing, essentially, well not even testing, abusive use um, by the fact that it's attached on the end of a long lever. So when you've got a bayonet on the end of a rifle or a musket and you're stabbing something with it, it's essentially a spearhead at that point, it's going to come under a lot of lateral forces and a lot of, um, um, a lot of uh, tension, um, which you won't get with something that's held in your hand and only has a blade of that long. So you can afford to make, you can afford to reprofile the, the blade to make it more slender, um, lighter and more pointy. And of course, therefore, if it is thinner and more pointy, it will go through clothing more easily. Um, and never underestimate how difficult it can be to get even a very pointy object through thick winter clothing. If you've got a thick woolen coat over the top of a uniform, um, then that's quite a lot of stuff to get through and still go into a person far enough that you're going to incapacitate them and prevent them from killing you um, or wounding you. So shortening the blade first thing, there are other adaptations we start to see as well. One of them that I have seen sometimes is the ring on the back of the um, bayonet here. You sometimes see that ring sawn off. You don't need the ring, so you could argue it's one way of making the weapon lighter. Um, it's possible that another reason for taking the ring off is to make it uh, more comfortable to grip in certain ways if you're gripping it as, as a fighting knife. Um, with the uh, Lebel or Le Libel, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, French bayonet for example, it has a curved quillon or quillon on the front and you sometimes see that has been chopped off. And in fact, the early versions of the SMLE bayonets actually have a curved quillon as well, but they removed those off the bayonets because they found they were always getting caught on things. And indeed, if even if your bayonet net fighting. I presume the reason why they put them on originally is because you could kind of lock onto an opponent's weapon with that curved quill on. But actually that's a disadvantage because you don't want your bayonet to get caught up with the opponent's weapon. So very soon on, in fact if you can get one with a curved quill on they're worth more money, uh, but very soon on they removed those front uh, quill ons off the SMLE bayonet because they just kind of get in the way in every context. Um, and finally, the other adaptation I have seen um, is reshaping of the grip. Now, this is one specific thing that I have always found when holding um, many types of bayonet. I have to say the SMLE is not a, a bad um, example of this. But if we take, for example, the French 1866 Chassepot bayonet, the Yatagan bladed Chassepot bayonet, very attractive bayonet, a very good blade that could be potentially very effective in close combat purely as a handheld weapon. But the problem is the shape of the grip because of the groove or slot at the back with the sprung um, catch there which goes onto a lug that engages onto your firearm that on the Chaspo bayonet for example which obviously is 50 years earlier is very uncomfortable in the hand because it has a long groove going right the way up the back of the bayonet the French uh, Libel bayonet, I would say, is also relatively uncomfortable in the hand for me personally because it has a groove all the way up the back and it sits really uncomfortably in the hand. As it happens, the British SMLE bayonet doesn't have a groove running very far, it only has a groove at the end. So actually when you hold this like a knife, whether it's thumb up or in a hammer grip, you don't really feel that groove very much, so it's not a problem. But nevertheless, I have indeed seen a um, SMLE bayonet that was converted to be a fighting knife where they have literally just sawn off the entire pommel, probably not to throw at someone, but probably just to make the grip more comfortable as a fighting knife and again to make it lighter. 
So to sum up, could you use a World War One bayonet as a, a fighting knife? Well, yes, obviously, absolutely, you could. It's a it's a pointy edged object with a handle at one end, and that is exactly what they why they had handles on them. They weren't like socket bayonets that were only to be used either on the end of a rifle or no other way they were they did have handles on them for that very reason and absolutely you could use them as that no question could you make them better as fighting knives yes and in fact they did in world war one usually by shortening the blade reshaping the tip to make it more effective as a hand weapon rather than as a pole weapon essentially sometimes changing the guard sometimes taking bits off the guard in fact and sometimes changing the shape or length of the grip as well partly to reduce weight and partly just to make it better in the hand so yep yeah, absolutely absolutely they were used as fighting knives but they were also sometimes and not infrequently it has to be said um, changed chopped and changed and adapted to make them into better fighting knives if we look at something more like the modern k-bar um, I won't say the British SA-80 bayonet because that is a total piece of turd. Um, but if we look at the, the K-bar type um, fighting knives used by the US military um, in World War II and, and um, you know, through to Vietnam and even now, um, those are essentially Bowie knives. Yes, absolutely. I, I would say for the most part, they're not great Bowie knives, but they're okay. They're fine. They'll do the job. Um, World War I bayonets tend to be too long to be fighting knives um, and for that very reason they were they were generally speaking made shorter and it's very notable that very soon after or in fact really during world war one but also very soon after there was a general tendency to make bayonets shorter so that they were more effective as camp knives easier to carry more effective as fighting knives and indeed because it'd been noted in world war one that sometimes the penetration was too deep and uh, they didn't want over penetration and in fact in many cases a shorter blade whilst you might think in a dueling situation a longer blade is always better in practical reality they often found that a shorter blade had advantages and of course you've got to remember durability as well if you're making a long blade it's under a lot of strain and stress because there's so much leverage on it you make a shorter blade it's easier to make it more durable i hope that was moderate really interesting and i'll see you for the next video cheers folks thank you for watching please subscribe and feel free to follow us on facebook